The first thing I want to do is uh, acknowledge uh, that this paper is based on a joint paper that Stuart Rosewarne and I gave at the International Studies Association conference in San Francisco uh, a few weeks ago. So uh, Stuart is also a contributor to the ideas in my talk. I want to start with a few observations about this well-known phenomenon that's on everybody's lips in the media of resource booms. And then I want to look at the other side, what we might call the dark side of the resource boom, which some have called the resource curse, although you don't hear about that quite so much. And then I want to focus on a particular aspect of the resource curse, which is the coal industry in New South Wales. And then I want to go in, zoom in a bit closer and talk about um, Hunter Valley and the coal affected communities and take a, a closer look at something that I think is not very well attended to in a lot of the public debates, which is the environmental and social costs of a resource curse or a coal curse. And then I want to finish on a perhaps more optimistic note, um, the prospects for environmental justice in all of this. So just looking at the resource boom in Australia and making a few very basic points, uh, we can see the characteristics um, are similar to what characterise a lot of resource booms, which is a sustained incre increase in resource commodity exports since 2003. And of course, there have been mineral uh, resources as well as energy resources. In the case of energy resources, uh, very dominantly um, uh, characterised by coal. Most of these exports are going to East Asia markets, um, Japan, Taiwan, Korea, China, and uh, of late to some other countries like India. We see in a situation of a resource boom a, consi a, a, a consistent expansion of the economy, which um, is often you know, celebrated and politicians and economists and companies take credit for such a, a positive development. And there are certainly, uh, apparently, a lot of winners in a resource boom. We can see high company profits. We can see high government income from royalties and taxes. And of course, very good credit ratings that governments get because of this uh, very active um, uh, economy. And of course, the people who are involved in the resource boom sectors are usually getting pretty good wages and conditions. In the case of coal, um, this resource boom seems so attractive that the projected coal production uh, in Australia is uh, set to go on apparently at 3.3% per annum until 2035, um, if climate change of course doesn't get us all before then. So this is just one graph to give you a sense um, of the trajectory of this boom and you can see the energy um, trajectory in red, mostly coal and you can see the minerals, mostly iron ore, but also some other minerals like silver or zinc or copper in Australia. And you can see the salad days of the coal boom there, um, 2008 to 9, uh, really um, huge increase in prices. The thermal coal coming out of Newcastle was getting about $200 per tonne. It's now down to about 90, but still very high and very easy to make profits out of those sorts of prices. And that's just a closer look at thermal coal exports um, in Australia. These are from the Australian Bureau of um, Resource and Agricultural Economics. Um, and the thermal coal exports, again, you can see the spike in the value, uh, the red line, uh, 2008 to 9. And you can see the um, consistent trajectory upwards. But now, as prices are lower, of course, it comes, unfortunately for a lot of the communities, um, by higher rates of coal production. The only way the companies can keep the profits up is to dig out more coal. So a lower price of coal in that sense is not necessarily a good thing in the short term. So what about the curse in this boom? Um, we can see um, a number of issues that have already been raised as problems in a lot of public debate. One of them, of course, is the increased value of the Australian dollar. That's nice if you're taking an overseas holiday or buying goods from overseas, but it's actually quite a bad thing in terms of other export industries in Australia. And they become less competitive because of this high Australian dollar 
and the higher cost of our goods. Um, you can also see that high wages in the particular favoured sectors that are currently in the resource boom does suck, uh, it, it distorts or sucks labour out of other parts of the economy and you find uh, difficulties with attracting workers and also reduced productivity. So I guess um, when we look at the resource boom from the point of view of a resource curse, there's a different set of questions that we have to ask and they are about the environmental and social costs of a resource curse. If we look a bit more closely at New South Wales, we can see clearly that the resources boom here has been dependent very much on black coal exports, and in particular on thermal coal, which is the coal that's used to fire up coal-fired electricity power stations, both here and overseas. This industry is very much dominated by transnational corporations in New South Wales, all the big multinational corporations, BHP Billiton, Peabody, Extrada, Rio Tinto, are all out in force in the Hunter Valley, uh, owners of very huge mines. And indeed, Newcastle has the world's largest black coal exporting port. In 2012, 134 million tonnes of black coal went out of the port of Newcastle. I just wanted to mention briefly coal seam gas, knowing that Drew had gone before me, um, and, and to talk about the fact that there has been a rapid expansion also in coal seam gas. And on some of the figures around, there's a, a projection that 50% of the Eastern Australian um, gas supply will come from coal seam gas by 2030. Not if Drew's got anything to do with it, I'm sure. Um, but it's not quite as germane to my discussion just because it's not an export commodity and in that sense not uh, contributing to the resource boom that I'm discussing here, which is the coal boom in New South Wales. So if we look at impact of coal on the New South Wales economy, we can see that um, we've got a government who's actually addicted to coal royalties, $1.2 billion. Um, went into the government coffers in 2012 from coal. There was a point when poker machines and gaming were far bigger than um, coal in the uh, royalty and tax receipts, but I think that coal is now perhaps on a par or even overtaking. Um, it's often said that mining uh, industry and this particular boom is a really big employer. Certainly that's what the companies say. But if you look at the actual statistics, uh, it's only 1.5% of the state labour force. So looking at the economic impact in New South Wales on employment, it's actually not all that big. Even in a coal mining area like the Hunter Valley, it's only 6% of the labour force involved in mining. But we do see in New South Wales, as in other parts of Australia, the strong Australian dollar has led to a decline in the competitiveness of other export sectors, and we would particularly note here uh, tourism, education, um, agriculture, and of course manufacturing, and there's been some pretty grim statistics on manufacturing recently in Australia and New South Wales. The other thing to mention, um, and it's already been mentioned by Rosemary and others, is the very huge amount of subsidies that taxpayers in Australia and New South Wales pay um, for, uh, the to the coal industry to support its operations and some of the ones we might mention are the very large amount of government funding that goes into infrastructure costs like rails and road uh, and ports and also of course the diesel fuel subsidy which um, amounts to about two billion dollars a year. Coal, uh, mi or mining companies in Australia do not pay the tax that the rest of us, business and residents, uh, pay on diesel fuel and that amounts to $2 billion, which interestingly enough is about the amount that the government wants to yank out of universities um, to pay for <laughs> some of its um, other uh, reforms. Um, and also, of course, the Clean Energy Future Act has massive amounts of funding um, dedicated to supporting both uh, dirty coal mines, continuing employment in very polluting and emissions-intensive coal mines, and also in um, power stations. So just moving on and zooming in a little bit further to the Hunter region in New South Wales, we've got a really beautiful region here 
Um, it's defined by the catchment of the Hunter River. It's a large region with the Newcastle port there on the coast, going right down to uh, Lake Macquarie and up towards the Liverpool Ranges. And um, in, in this region, which is a long established agricultural region, region, mining is very intensively competing with agriculture um, in, in many areas, and particularly in the Upper Hunter area where a lot of the open cut coal mines are located, and that's the area you can see there from Singleton right up to Musselbrook and beyond to Aberdeen. I think the interesting thing about this map, if you can see the colour coding from where you are, is that um, the red is the horse breeding studs, the uh, purple is the vineyards, and the yellow is the fertile um, agricultural land in the alluvial, alluvial soils of the Hunter Valley, uh, the Hunter River. And you can see how close the coal mines are and also how close they are uh, to the national parks which are etched out there in green. And 16% uh, of this land area actually of the Hunter, upper Hunter Valley floor is occupied completely by open cut mines. And another 64% of the land area, which is the hatched area on the map, is actually uh, exploration leases for coal mines. It's probably worth saying when you're looking at all this black on the map and you're thinking, where is this coal going? 75% of the coal produced in the Hunter Valley uh, is exported and the other 25% goes into the power stations in the Hunter Valley and el elsewhere in New South Wales. This is what it looks like if you haven't seen an open cut coal mine before. This is the Mount Arthur mine in the Upper Hunter. It's the biggest coal mine in the Hunter Valley. It's owned by BHP Billiton and it produces 20 megatons of coal uh, per annum. This gives you a sense of what it's like to be a farming community near a coal mine. Um, this is Mount Arthur mine in the foreground and in the background is the rather unfortunately sighted Camberwell village. Um, and dividing them is actually the New England Highway, which isn't so clear on this photo, is owned by Yankol, which is a Chinese firm, 90% and 10% by Ithoku Corp, which is a, a Japanese firm. And this is an aerial view of Camberwell Village. It's sort of, yeah, in the middle there, and you can see that all around uh, those light sections are the um, large coal mines. So this is a village uh, almost completely encircled by coal mines and there are quite a few villages in the Hunter Valley in that situation. Just to move on to the impacts of coal mining, um, a few of them anyway, um, these are 24 hour 7 operations, there's trucks, drag lines, machinery operating all the time, bright lights, noise, um, blasting to, to loosen up the, the seams for mining and of course all the rail and road traffic that goes with that. There's also a lot of water issues, damage, saline discharge from mines and power stations, cracked creek beds, um, damage to aquifers, and um, priority use of irrigation water by mines, even in times of drought when farmers can't get enough water. The land after, after mining is sterile, um, and there's of course lots of local species and bi uh, biodiversity. Uh, Marginalisation of rural life is another really important aspect of the costs of mining in the Hunter Valley. And I've just mentioned some of the main points there, the destruction of the land, of Aboriginal sites, uh, shortage of workers for farms, high cost of living hits low income people and lack of effective political representation. I'm rushing through a bit because I'm running out of time. Um, but the health impacts of the coal industry um, include all these respiratory problems, uh, lung cancer, non-fatal heart attacks and premature deaths, all from the particulate matter from mining, from coal, uh, power stations and diesel. I could go into the health issues from water, but they've already been mentioned by others. But I would just like to mention there the mental health problems uh, that people have coping with mine developments and environmental degradation. And then, of course, there's the climate impacts of the coal industry um, which I won't go into except I think the statistics are probably known to a lot of people here and um, there are local climate change impacts of this that people are already noticing. Um, uh, Hurricane Katrina has already been mentioned 
Um, in the uh, Hunter Valley, there was, for example, the beaching of the Pasha Bolka coal container, ironically enough, during the so-called one in a hundred year storm in 2007. And then there was the big dust storm that particularly hit the upper Hunter with all the dust coming off the coal in 2009. The community opposition um, to these sorts of developments is really strong and growing. And uh, there's a broad-based op opposition now, both rural and urban. And I did take a lot of note of what Drew said about the fact that farmers don't really think of themselves as activists. But I've noticed in working in the Hunter Valley over the last 10 years, farmers have become activists and they have become much more outspoken, much more cynical about government and companies. Uh, land and water issues in particular tend to be the province of farmers, whereas the health risks um, from coal mining and power stations tend to draw in a very, very large body of the population. And in the Hunter Valley, there's been a huge mobilisation and alliance of community groups all up and down the valley uh, fighting the fourth coal loader in the port of Newcastle, which is set to raise the coal exports uh, of the port to 270 million tonnes in a few years. There's also, of course, um, community opposition um, around coal seam gas. I just wanted to mention that. And uh, climate change, but climate change does tend to be more of an urban environmentalist issue. It's not necessarily one um, that farmers are willing uh, to take up. Just to finish up, the prospects for environmental justice in this situation, what are they? It all looks a bit bleak. But I think we have to first remember that resource booms always end. And uh, hopefully this one will soon. We seem to be in the tail end of it. Um, there's lots of successful legal challenges. Some of those have already been mentioned. There's also been a progressive loss of the social licence to operate. Um, in, for companies in affected communities. And this comes along, I think, with the disenchantment that's been felt and the very effective civil disobedience over coal seam gas and also the uh, challenges to mines. There's been a very successful Hunter campaign for successful dust monitoring. That really is the biggest health concern up in the Hunter Valley. And um, lots of new uh, community alliances, as I just mentioned. And of course, there has been some effective electoral pressure. We've seen some changes in regulatory framework and proposals recently. I just want to finish up with the question, though, given that this is about environmental and social justice, what are the prospects uh, for environmental and social justice on a planetary scale? This is also, uh, in the Hunter Valley, very much about producing greenhouse gas emissions on a massive scale and not really taking responsibility for them at a company or government level. And uh, is there any prospect for keeping the coal in the ground? Thank you.